officials of the Caribbean, Secretary Generals of the Caribbean National Commissions for UNESCO, officials of the Caribbean Ministries of Education, members of the Global Coalition for Education, UNESCO colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to ravage the Caribbean small island development states, we are gathered today to learn, learn more about the Global Co Education Coalition and explore how we can leverage this unique partnership to build resilience in education systems in the English and Dutch speaking Caribbean. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are central to mobilizing expertise and resources to respond to the needs and challenges of our Caribbean member states. This to reimagine education and ensure that our learners have 21st century skills. We want to keep hope alive for our learners. We want them to plan for their futures. We look forward to an interactive and informed dialogue today to explore how the Global Coalition can address some of the pressing issues member states in the Caribbean are facing today. As we begin, I extend a very warm welcome to my colleague, Dr. Valentin Sir Mendes, who made it possible for us to have this dialogue today. And I welcome the distinguished members of the Global Coalition who are joining us for today's exploratory dialogue. We have with us today, Ms. Alexa Joyce, the Microsoft Global Lead, Dr. Joel Armando, Blackboard Academy, Product Manager and Faculty, Professor Robert Liu, Lab Exchange at Harvard University, Faculty Director and Principal uh, Investigator, Ms. Lauren Lichtman, Partnerships Lead, Learning Equality, and Francesco Cavallari, founder and president of Video Games Without Borders. Welcome to all of you. We had a technical consultation on 10th of June uh, last month to, debrie to debrief on the global and regional steering committee meetings uh, for education 2030. Today, we are here together because first we need an education recovery plan so that we can get our learners back to school. Second, we want to build back better. Third, we have seen the digital divide leaves millions of learners behind as they are denied the right to learn because they don't have access to internet. Our teachers are seeking to build professional capacity to respond to the challenges of blended and remote learning and we want to support the marginalized. Objectives of today's consultation are to exchange information on the Global Coalition for Education, gain an understanding on how selected education partners can uh, work together and we want to initiate an exploratory dialogue on how selected members of the coalition can provide support to education in the Caribbean to mitigate the impact of the health pandemic. So you see the agenda for today's meeting. Uh, I'm shortly after this short brief welcome, I'm going to give the floor to our colleague, Dr. Valton Sir uh, Mendes who will introduce us and tell us more about the Global Coalition for Education. Um, and uh, this will be followed by presentations by selected education partners. We have with us Microsoft, Blackboard Academy, Lab Exchange at Harvard University, Learning Equality and Video Game Without Borders. And then we come to the heart of the discussion. We want to have an interactive dialogue with our member states and this is a preliminary dialogue with you know, a smaller group uh, where, and my colleague Latoya Swabi Anderson is going to moderate the session. We want to hear from the countries, what are your challenges? What are your priorities after listening to the presentations by our partners so that we can start looking at 
some key priority areas for possible collaboration. After the discussion with our member states, we'll give the floor to our colleague Val Mendes, who is going to then, you know, share with us some key priorities that are feasible and concrete based on our dialogue today, and we will discuss next steps. And then we'll conclude with some closing remarks and um, we look forward to a very interactive dialogue today. So without much ado, I'm very happy to hand over to uh, Dr. Val Tansir Mendes. Um, over to you, Val. Thank you very much for making this happen. We are very, very appreciative of, you know, you're making this possible for us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fariel. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here joining the, the Caribbean, the UNESCO cluster office, and also all the colleagues and uh, all the participants that are uh, joining us today. So thank you. Um, and I'm talking from UNESCO headquarters, and uh, I'd like to share with you this initiative that uh, was just uh, created, uh, that is the Global Education Coalition that uh, we have the pleasure to share with you in the context of the Caribbean uh, today. So let's just check if the presentation is working okay. Yeah. So we have, uh, we, from UNESCO, we have been monitoring the, the school closure all over the world. In one point of the crisis of the coronavirus and the COVID-19 crisis, we have around 1.5 billion students affected by the schools and university closure. So right now we have around 1 billion, 1 billion point two, but we know that this is um, the impact that this has in all the education systems is really, really massive. And we need to remember that this crisis comes on top of a previous one, that is the learning crisis that UNESCO have been advocating to mitigate for many, many years. And we had the last figures we, we worked on, we have more than 600 million children and adolescents that were not learning. And they were in a school. So we can imagine it now the, the situation that we have. In this, with this context, um, UNESCO with different, uh, in, through different meetings with uh, ministers of education, decide to create this coalition. So, the idea was to mobilize and ease, to mobilize different actors, different resources, uh, and uh, get uh, organizations together and organize a coordination action in trying to match different country needs. So for us, it's very important this point, is a country and it's a needs-driven coalition. And then what we want to do is to match these needs with the resource and with the uh, different um, uh, elements that uh, uh, the members of the coalition bring to the table. So we want to do that and in the end provide uh, different uh, distance learning solutions and programs to the countries that in this moment are, are most in need. And we have our, um, just now around 130 partners collaborating through the, the coalition. So our main goals are this one. We want to support this continuation of learning. And for this reason, this learning never stops is our main focus of this campaign. Then we want to ensure actually a full and a fair return to school. So we know that different countries in this moment are uh, impacted in different ways. So there are countries already returning to school, but it's not the same as before. So we need to have a proper planning on that. And then in the end, what we want is to take advantage somehow of this challenge, make it an opportunity and to create a more resilient system. We want to create education systems that are future ready. So, and this connects with other initiatives of UNESCO. And how the coalition works. So we have basically three main flagships. The first one is on connectivity. And we mean by connectivity all, um, let's say, um, human, the human dimension of the connectivity, the access you know, to resource, to access to these uh, internet connections, and also the technical one, how we can bring connectivity to remote uh, areas that you, we know that nowadays is in many countries is, is a necessity. The second flagship is teachers, how we can empower you know, teachers 
and uh, protecting, for example, their status, the first one, no? how we can give capacity building. So here, for example, we have, and we have the pleasure to announce today, uh, we have Blackboard here with us and they will start running a test, a pilot uh, in teacher training for the region, for the Caribbean. Uh, and then the third point of the gender equality, uh, the, the third uh, flagship is gender equality. We know that in crises like, like this one, girls and women are the most affected one. So we want to keep a, a close a look and a, a close work on the gender dimension. And how, how we do this, you know, how the coalition works. Um, so first of all, is, is this kind of meeting we are having. We try to understand what are the needs on the, gro on the ground. So we work with, uh, in cooperation with the ministries of education to try to do a proper needs assessment. Based on this needs assessment, we go to the members of the coalition and we try to leverage this resource and these uh, different elements that the coalition members are bringing to the, to the discussion. And then what we do is a proper planning, you know, a distance learning planning, and we go to the implementation phase. So very briefly, because I, I want to not to keep you uh, without listening to the partners that are coming after me, uh, this is the, how we are working in terms of the coalition. I'm happy to join later the debate and we'll have more time to go into the details, but just a, a quick introduction. So thank you very much and looking forward to, to continue the discussion. Back to you. Sorry, you? sorry, I was muted. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Val. Uh, this is so important because uh, you know sometimes at the level of uh, a subregion, we don't, we are not always up to date on what is happening at the the policy uh, global policy dialogue. Uh, so we really appreciate this opportunity to translate global policy dialogue to action on the ground in the Caribbean, and we thank you for your very clear presentation. I'm delighted to have uh, to now open up the floor for our distinguished uh, presenters from our partners of the Global Coalition. We will begin today with Blackboard Academy. We have with us Dr. Joel uh, Armando, to, who is a product manager, but also a faculty at Blackboard Academy. Um, so we look forward to your presentation, uh, Joel. Thank you, Farial, and thank you for having us today here. Uh, it's, a, it's really a pleasure. It's my, my first meeting, and I'm really excited about the plans that we have uh, in working together. So I'm going to share my screen. Please uh, confirm that you can see it and you're seeing the right screen. Is that OK? <laughs> um, oops. Uh, yes. can, can you, is that the presentation that is showing? Yes, it is. Yes, we're yes. excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yes. Yeah. So uh, first, probably very, very shortly, um, for for those of you who haven't heard about Blackboard before, or probably you haven't heard about the the work that Blackboard does in terms of professional development for teachers. Uh, we we are an educational technology company that leader in, in the world and been working in educational technologies for more than twenty years now. And particularly in Blackboard Academy, what we do is professional development for uh, teachers, faculty, and also for all the teacher, teaching and learning staff uh, and support in, in the institutions. So the, um, the work that, and, and the reason why we, as, co as an educational technology company, uh, do professional development is because we firmly believe that there is no way to produce any kind of change or innovation in education if we if we think that only the technologies will will make it so that the, the only way of producing innovation and produce change is working with people and working with practices and culture and that's what really makes uh, the difference so and, and that's our approach to to professional development and and i i know i have just a few minutes so i'm going to focus in the project and the project in which uh, we will be working together and and this is uh, a a professional development uh, course for teachers, uh, hopefully a large scale. <laughs> we are trying to cover um, a, a, a large group of teachers and make a big impact. 
So in, in, in our, as you can see in the, in the screen, our approach to professional development when we work a, light, a large scale is trying to combine uh, online courses with community, building community and providing support uh, with colleagues and providing a set of um, what we call facilitators kit, which is a set of guidelines, uh, quick start uh, sheets, uh, some uh, slide decks and resources for micro learning to continue working when the teachers finish the online courses. So basically how they can keep the conversation offline after finishing the courses or even while they're taking the courses. So this, this is uh, basically the three components of our um, approach uh, to, to any kind of professional development at large scale. And in this particular project in which uh, hopefully we will be working together very soon, uh, we, we will focus on this course, which is a course uh, that is about blended learning and online strategies uh, for teachers. Um, and it, it's a course that is about 16 to 20 hours uh, of, of a study. And the topics, as you can see there, are about online online teaching, providing content to students, addressing the needs of diverse learners when you work uh, online. We know that inclusivity and diversity is particularly challenge, uh, challenging in, in online settings, and, and we, we are seeing this uh, even worse in, in this particular context how to use video to teach and how to support uh, students uh, and, and communicate with them. So that's, these for us are the basic uh, components uh, to start thinking about teaching online and, and in blended learning environments uh, for, for uh, K to 12, so for primary and secondary education. Um, and, and this course, basically it's an on, on of course, a fully online, of online course, uh, which is a combination of some synchronous and asynchronous activities. It has a lot of content, quality content with videos, multimedia presentations, uh, some knowledge checks of so teachers can kind of check their understanding while they're taking the course. But also it's a facilitated course in which uh, the idea is to promote collaboration and to promote reflection, which is key uh, to change any, any kind of uh, teaching practices. Um, in the plan, and, and that's why we mentioned uh, the larger scale at the beginning, is to work with a group of trained trainers uh, or, or, or facilitators, uh, future facilitators, and, and work with this group. And they will take the course. Uh, they will take another two courses that will help them to facilitate online and to use the technologies that they will need to facilitate the course. And then these people will be uh, cascading the online uh, courses with more people in, in the region. So basically that's, uh, that's how, and we will be supporting by providing hosting for the courses and providing also uh, what I mentioned before, the facilitator kit. Um, that's why for the um, facilitators, <laughs> they will need to take two more courses, one about uh, the, the, the course that they will deliver, but also a course about how to use the platform in which they will deliver and a course about how to facilitate uh, synchronous sessions uh, that will be part of the delivery. So that's, that's, these three courses are for the trained, uh, for the future trainers or, or facilitators. And that, that was a very quick presentation, <laughs> but I, I will be happy to answer any questions or maybe Fayal, if you think I should focus in, in any, anything in particular, I can, I can take it now, uh, otherwise. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be part of it, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very exciting, and uh, thank you for sharing, because this is one of our greatest needs in the region, providing support to teachers to cope with online uh, teaching and learning strategies, but in an inclusive way, where they can respond to the diversity of needs of the learners. Uh, keeping attention to learners with special needs, but also um, other diversity of needs. So uh, this would be really exciting if we can work together. And um, it, uh, we have the office covers 20 countries, as you know, so it would be good to perhaps have a regional approach where we could have two master trainers from each country, if possible, uh, so that, you know, in each country, there should be a pair of master trainers mm -hmm. who can then 
uh, you know, create that community of practice mm -hmm. within the country, but then also across the Caribbean countries. And uh, we hope that in the interactive dialogue, we can have further discussion and also hear from our member states on what Perfect. would be possible next steps. But thank you very much, Alexa. No, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Joel. <laughs> no thank you, Joel. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciatively. And uh, I you. understand. Uh, thank you. I understand uh, Lauren has to perhaps leave now. No, uh, no, no, I'm good. You're good. good. Very yeah. good. So we have Microsoft next. Uh, we, uh, uh, Guillermo is uh, your colleague here from Microsoft. Alexa? Yes, uh, she's here. Alexa, welcome. Thank you. Um, great to be here. And I'm really, it's always a pleasure to present to UNESCO colleagues as I, before joining Microsoft, I was part of the ICT and education team for a while in UNESCO Bangkok. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to always be in touch with UNESCO specialists. Um, I'm going Once to- UNESCO, always UNESCO. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's like the Hotel California. <laughs> right. Um, so um, I want to share a little bit about how we've been working in the Global Edu Education Coalition from the Microsoft perspective. Uh, it's been a really, really rewarding partnership in many countries that we're engaged in around the world. And so it's, it's fantastic to get the opportunity to work with you all today to think about how we might work in a similar way with the Caribbean countries. And um, we really wanted, as we started to think about the challenges of COVID and shifting to distance and hybrid learning scenarios, make sure that we had a good research anchored framework in the way that we thought about this process. And so the first thing that we did together, both within the Microsoft team, but also in conversation with ministries of education, for instance, in Senegal and across Africa, where we really got um, into close partnership early on as part of the global education coalition we found that essentially most countries that that we're working with in the context of the coalition and indeed most globally fit somewhere between what we call the no or low connectivity or emerging connectivity scenario so thinking about how in terms of a national strategy with a ministry of education can we address this mixed connectivity scenario where some students within a country may have no access some students in a country have intermittent access or expensive access. They might be sharing a smartphone with peers or with siblings, maybe not a computer in the house. And um, then uh, equally kind of more emerging connectivity scenarios where we might have connectivity, but it could be that it's um, expensive or slow. And so we really wanted to work together as we thought about this process to make sure that we took account of the digital context of students and of families as we work together with ministries of education to think about distance um, and remote learning strategies and so we produced this decision tree which has really helped to guide our thinking as we work closely with ministries of education and the unesco teams around the world to understand where we need to focus our attention and most of the countries that we've been working with are actually taking a blended approach mixing having digital platforms for students where they're able to access them increasing device and connectivity programs to reach out to those students who don't have that access but also recognizing that there probably are parts of many countries that we're working with that aren't going to be able to get access to students in a short period of time. And so using the broadcast media as a kind of air cover to enable some degree of learning continuity, even for those who have the lowest possible types of access. Um, so when we think about what do we develop in terms of the learning process, from a Microsoft perspective where we can really bring value is around the stage two and we worked really hard with our engineering teams to actually reconfigure our products and re reconfigure our services like teams so that they could work more effectively both on and offline because given that many students are working with being online as only small part of the day if they are able to get connectivity it was essential to actually rework some of our learning platforms so that students could work offline, reconnect, resync their materials up to a platform and not have to be consistently connected during their learning experience. And so this meant we had to rapidly create what I would call kind of emergency pedagogy toolkits to make it easy for teachers to think about how they could deliver some form of asynchronous learning 
through an online platform with a relatively low level of training because we although we think it's important to have a training program over time given the emergency situation of needing to quickly um, enable more uh, digital pedagogy we saw this real need to actually create a model that enabled teachers to take advantage of paper-based approaches but to communicate them through digital platforms, for instance, by using um, mobile phone scanning apps to scan their content that they might have in traditional paper textbooks or even handwritten worksheets that they want to share with students. And at the same time on the student side, recognizing that many students would be working on paper and helping them to do the same thing to then understand they can use those types of tools to scan back up their paper assignments and share them with their, with their teachers. So really thinking about what those scenarios are and how we could make them as easy as possible was something that was really core in the way that we started to work together with ministries of education. And something that we developed with a number of the ministries that we worked with so far in the coalition has been a set of blueprints, which I'll share with you um, after this call. On one hand, from the technology side, also from the teaching and learning side that help to guide a ministry of education through an end to end process of how they go about deploying a quick response uh, approach to enabling digital learning. So first of all, making sure that, that there is the identities, logins, passwords, all of that set up to be able to access the digital learning platform, which Microsoft provides for free for education systems using our A1 licensing. Creating plans for longer term device and connectivity strategies for provisioning students who don't have access and to begin then the training program. And what we see is that on one hand, we kind of kick off the process by having this what I call short course um, uh, introduction into how to use very simple pedagogy, but then also to reinforce through national training experts by doing a train the trainer approach to cascade out to the local level of teachers and through the online platforms that Microsoft offers, offers already in many, many languages, we've quickly made available a huge number of courses on remote learning for inclusion, remote learning for um, engaging with all types of different students in different subject areas. And those are available not just in English, but in multiple languages, including Spanish, got resources in Dutch as well. So there's a, a wide range of materials that can be leveraged, as well as our network of expert educators who are based around the world who act as local champions that we can build on. So we've been putting in place these training plans in partnership with ministries of education and together with the Microsoft um, training, training partner network, as well as individual teacher champions. So we really try to approach this when working with ministries of education as a holistic challenge going right through from that creation of student and teacher identity, making sure that it's private and safe, putting in place the teaching and learning platform using Teams as the hub for the teaching and learning process, um, working as um, advisors to the ministries of education, because many ministries are saying to us, what kind of devices should we procure? What do teachers need compared to what do students need? What do students need at age 16 versus age 10? Um, how do we prioritize? So we've really been sitting alongside ministries of education as they design those approaches and bringing in our specialist partners who can then support ministries as they move through procurement plans to um, get devices and connectivity in the hands of, of students. And then from a, a Microsoft perspective, we're also um, working now through the Global Education Coalition to bring together a core group of countries who want to leverage the data that's been generated by digital platforms used by teachers and students to start to gain insight into learning. And we also offer a huge set of skills training curriculum, which we're now bringing into the partnership as well, which is focused more at the higher level for kind of technical and vocational, particularly or um, early stage of higher education to get really employability and job market um, skills um, curriculum in the hands of faculty and teachers and in the hands of students. So we're really trying to go end to end. Um, we've got a huge number of these um, blueprints, advisory documents that have been generated by the partnership, which you can access on this um, link at the top of this, this slide. We've also got um, deployment guidance that we can work with ministries of education to set up the free teaching and learning platform. I would add it's free forever. It's not a short term COVID offer um, that leveraging our expertise to help design the national strategies and connectivity plans 
we've got a huge range of webinars which we continue to offer through the region and globally in lots of languages as well as the self-paced learning and we've also created a ton of learning resources for students and for parents to use in the home um, knowing that uh, essentially the parents have have defaulted into the role of the teacher in many locations because of the, the situation. So um, I hope that in a short period of time gave you a good overview of how we can support the UNESCO teams and the ministries of education that you work with in the region. Um, my colleague Guillermo is also here to answer questions about what we're doing specifically in, um, in our Latin American and Caribbean countries that we're working with and excited to deepen the partnership in, with you. Thank you so much, Alexa. This, this, this is so on the spot <laughs> with what our countries need. Uh, I mean, you spoke about, you know, working in contexts which had uh, no or low uh, connectivity, but also emerging connectivity, and then focusing also on, uh, you know, I really like your technology blueprint, uh, and, and it would be great to hear also from our member states, uh, how they see uh, how Microsoft could potentially work with them but uh, the, but your your training platform you know for for providing training for teaching and learning um, uh, parents are struggling so the resources that you have available uh, for parents and school leaders uh, for skills development uh, is is going to be critical. So uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, what you are offering is really spot on. I think that the next step would be the interactive dialogue with our member states to see what would be the best fit in terms of some key strategic priorities uh, for to identify some potential areas uh, for collaboration with Microsoft. But, but this has been a very enriching presentation and thank you very much. For, for, for sharing uh, your uh, brilliant uh, services, which are so uh, tuned into what the countries need right now and the, what the ministries of education are uh, uh, focusing on right now. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm also very excited to introduce now Professor uh, Rob uh, Liu. Uh, uh, who is uh, from the Lab Exchange at Harvard University, a uh, faculty director and principal uh, investigator. So, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rob, oh, uh, Rob, over to you, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. My pleasure. So, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> As someone that was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica, it warms my heart beyond belief that all of this is sitting in my home country that I think is incredibly exciting that we're sort of helping bring these groups together because I think that's what you really need to do. So um, I'm going to talk about Lab Exchange, which I suspect may be the new kid on the block, right? So Lab Exchange was launched on January 24th in alignment with the UN International Day for Education. And what Lab Exchange represents quite simply is taking everything we've learned from the massive open online course developments with Coursera, with edX, etc and trying to unlock those functionalities instead of leaving them in the hands of institutions to broadcast courses to the world, try to create a platform based on what we have learned that puts the teacher and the learner in the driver's seat. And so that's what we've really tried to build. In full disclosure, I should mention that I was part of the whole founding, you know, in terms of edX on the Harvard side. So I built Harvard X. And so what we've done is we've taken all of that and created a platform built on the edX platform, so it's at scale, but that's entirely free, will be free forever, but also has a different learning model that we really hope will represent a new approach. So um, labexchange.org has been up since January. We're now at 700,000 users in these past six months. And so you can go in, you can access all the content, even without signing up for an account, but if you sign up for, a, for an account, it gives you a lot of functionality, which I think you might find very useful. The platform itself is very much focused on the life sciences. And the principle here is that ultimately, instead of thinking about fixed courses, you're able to filter and query, you know, according to topic, according to kind of media, and now you can get individual units. Might be video, might be text, 
might be a simulation, something like that. So you can find the individual pieces fully meta tagged for, the, for what you might be really interested in learning. But what I think is quite powerful is that if you sign up for an account as an educator, you have the power to actually build classes. So you can build your own classes, but very importantly, you can also build your own pathways. So on Lab Exchange, the learning units that we have a particular interest in is what's called a pathway. And the idea is what we learn from the massive open online courses is that you need to create sort of a short narrative that brings together text, video, interspersed, as I'm sure all of you know, with formative assessments, with all of the materials that, you stu that the students need aligned with learning objectives that you have defined. So this is actually a, a learning pathway which I've built for my eighth lecture for my summer course here at Harvard. I should mention that Lab Exchange's sweet spot right now is high school and college, right? So the high school level and the undergraduate level, the bachelor's degree level, but we're also increasingly starting, starting to move into the middle school uh, um, level of content as well. So what's I think powerful is that you can build these pathways and then with these pathways, you can actually share them in the context of a class. So for my class right now, here are my 60 plus students. Here are the pathways that I've built for them. And what I'm able to do is that I can track their discussion. I can even assign specific learners, specific material that we think is really important. And we can have our own discussions. For FERPA privacy, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into my, my students' progress so far this summer, but they're doing well, I'm really happy to say. What I should also point out is that um, Lab Exchange is not only a platform that allows you to search in our highly vetted um, public library materials you need, but one thing I should mention is that when you're building your own course, you can actually upload all of your own materials. So you can search the library. So for example, if you're going to build your own pathway, you can search the library of Lab Exchange, but you also have your own private library. And because all of the classes are private and FERPA compliant, it allows you to create a private environment where you can upload your own content, your own videos, et cetera, to teach your students. So Lab Exchange also has its own set of content with a focus on biology and in particular on biotechnology. So we have built a series of pathways that are really focused, very rich in multimedia, focused on various techniques in biotechnology like the use of restriction enzymes. But within that, we also have virtual labs. So we have 13 virtual labs. We hope to have 30 by the end of the year. And these are literally virtual labs where you can lead your students through the, the materials they'll use. You ask them to make predictions. They review the protocol. And then they have a virtual space where they're actually able to do experiments, use equipment, do settings, for example, and this really allows them to have the experience of doing an actual experiment. And then what happens is those results are recorded. They have to reflect on those results and the system gives them a summary. And so as you can see, we're also trying to build sort of content types that we think are particularly powerful. So for example, we have an entire, each of these is an individual pathway. We have an entire cluster focused on biotech. And then you can, for example, get recommendations based on what your starting point is on what material might be best for you. The last thing I'll point out is that we're also pushing a new model of partnering with, for example, OpenStax at Rice University to unbundle textbooks. So we have textbooks, for example, for AP Biology in high school. Very shortly, we will have about 30 different textbooks. But what we have done is we have taken the lab exchange model where you take a high quality open source textbook, but you reformat it in the format of lab exchange. So now each chapter in the textbook is actually a pathway. And what that means is that each subtopic within a particular chapter is now a separate asset that you can add into your pathway, you can share with your students. So the idea here is to really give you the power to personalize your learning. So you can sign up right now, you can do all of this. If you're a high school teacher, you can use this. If you're a college instructor, you can use this.
frankly, if you're a parent at home that wants to put together some materials for your children, you can certainly use this. So that's Lab Exchange. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for this very innovative approach. And uh, I feel it is also developing our own capacities because I'm learning so many new, <laughs> exciting uh, things from uh, Blackboard Academy, also from uh, Microsoft and now from LabEx. Um, I think uh, building your own uh, classes and pathways is something which is going to be so valuable. And, and you mentioned formative assessments and aligning with learning objectives and this is an area where our teachers are really uh, exploring support and they i think this would be something i look forward to the dialogue with our member states um, and another issue that came up was in my discussions with ministries was how do we transform the experience of a laboratory or a lab or a science lab or, or a technical and vocational education workshop into the virtual space? And, 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 and uh, uh, your uh, uh, approach is enabling us to uh, do that in a very, uh, very clear uh, way. So I think this, this is something we should definitely explore. And um, I also like the way you mentioned that the textbooks, so, so you know very much the, the, the Jamaican context, but within the Caribbean, uh, our take textbooks or teachers or parents could, uh, teachers could, uh, and school leaders could see if they can take some textbooks and uh, adapt them and create learning pathways using uh, your approach. So this, this could be a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your ideas and your approaches, very innovative. And um, uh, we would now like to welcome um, Lauren uh, Lichtman uh, from Learning Equality. Uh, I understand, Lauren, you have to be, so thank you so much for, uh, uh, and the floor is yours. No worries at all, I'll um, be here for some time. So thank you so much everyone for having me today. Uh, Learning Equality is incredibly honored to be among this esteemed group. And I'm, um, I should also note that my colleague, Karini Diaz, who leads our work in Latin America is also on the webinar today. So feel free to drop in questions in the chat window. I'm quite honored to go following Lab Exchange because I think you'll see a lot of similarity across our work. Uh, we similarly leverage open educational resources, develop learning pathways, and really um, maximize the modularity of content to be able to do that. Um, our focus is really in the K-12 space and in offline communities. And so um, excited to share more about our work. So at Learning Equality, we've developed Calibri um, and its ecosystem of products because we care about equity. We've always been focused on reaching the most marginalized and in light of the current pandemic, these communities are even harder to reach and we're concerned about the equity gap widening. So the Calibri learning platform that we've developed is open source software at the center of our product ecosystem that provides offline access to a curated and openly licensed educational content library. It's available for a variety of subject areas and grade levels, as well as different languages. It has tools for pedagogical support for differentiated and personalized learning um, that allows coaches to be able to group students into classes and then subgroups and then assign them lessons or quizzes um, for formative assessments. Like its predecessor platform, K Lite, it can run on a variety of low cost and legacy hardware devices, meaning that the infrastructure that exists in different locations can be leveraged and then supplemented with low cost hardware. Um, because it was designed for low resource and low connectivity context, it's really designed for offline first. And I think that's one of our key distinguishers. Um, and it has a distribution and access model that responds to the particular needs in different learning environments. Essentially, what we're able to do is create mini learning hubs um, so that some of the tools that educators can traditionally access online are now be able to access them offline. Um, and then again, the platform has special considerations for learning in lower resource contexts. So the Calibri learning platform is part of a broader Calibri ecosystem of products and tools that address some of the challenges related to limited infrastructure, lack of connectivity, lack of hardware, um, limited open educational resources in particular contexts, limited um, 
curriculum alignment for supplemental use. And so we have um, tools to address this. Um, in addition to the learning platform, we have the Calibri Studio curricular tool, an openly available content library and pipeline to import that content, a toolkit of adaptable resources to support training of the trainer models, which I've heard some themes of today and excited to explore further, and essential data and aggregation um, point to explore learner data in Calibri. Calibri has been um, to date used in 198 countries and territories, and this ecosystem as a whole supports both widespread organic adoption, given that most of the, e the ecosystem is open source and leverages openly licensed materials, um, but it's also been adopted by governments and INGOs at scale. In Latin America, there's over 4,500 known installations of Calibri. And again, these are instances of Calibri that may connect to the internet at some point. So we anticipate that there's um, definitely more. Um, with about 300 of these in the Caribbean, um, largest numbers in the Dominican Republic, followed by Trinidad, Tobago, and Haiti. Um, seeing some examples of the different models that can be supported by Calibri can help to envision what may work in the Caribbean. This ranges from Calibri's offline first access and distribution model um, to learning about the different ways resources can be organized, aligned to national curricula or to meet specific learning pathways um, and the different pedagogical models that can be employed. The Calibri EdTech Toolkit provides guidance on how different hardware models inform blended learning pedagogies and vice versa. So here are just a few examples on this slide from across the globe um, that we thought might be of interest to range across these different models. One example of Calibri in the Caribbean is specifically in the Dominican Republic with one of our hardware grantees um, that has been working to support schools um, there for some time. Um, Calibri was used in grade and middle schools in STEM subjects because there was a feeling that those um, subjects were the ones that teachers were at least resistant in terms of bringing technology into these practices. And they're able to leverage open educational resources like Khan Academy, like FET interactive simulations and others to be able to um, uh, go through this coursework. Um, upon a training of the trainer training session, uh, there is a realization of how important it is to, to teach educators on not just how to teach with technology, sorry, not just how to use technology, but really how to blend them into different learning environments. And for us, this implementation highlighted the fact that there are huge gaps in open educational resources in Spanish, especially in early and in, in the early grade levels. And so we're looking to do a gap analysis of OER across LAC um, this fall. So that's just one example. Um, but I think, of course, in response to the COVID pandemic, um, we're thinking really thoughtfully about how we can continue to support educators in distance learning where there is limited or no connectivity. Um, and this adds additional complexities. When the pandemic first hit, Learning Equality evaluated a matrix of varying levels of connect connectivity on one axis and um, varying levels of educator support on the other to best identify where we could play a role in supporting educators. And coming from that is, is what you see on this slide. Um, we've expanded our toolkit of ped pedagogical guidance materials and documentations to support both educators at a distance, but also caregivers in the home. Um, guidance documentation on how to set up the Calibri learning platform at home without the internet. Um, an updated content library with some aligned content as well as some topic specific content related to COVID. Um, an expanded uh, content library catalog to support improved discoverability, um, as well as some new feature development. And we're working on releasing our Android app with specific functionality for educators to share content via WhatsApp. To wrap up, um, and I think relevant for this discussion, it's um, helpful to share a bit more about how Calibri works with government and other organizations, uh, not only to support this evolving open ecosystem, but to positively impact learners and educators at scale. So while learning equality focuses on the blue um, boxes in the middle, it partners with organizations to focus on content for further distribution of learning resources, hardware that can be pre-provisioned, especially when there is limited connectivity, um, and implementations to better understand and respond to varying needs. 
Um, and at times we provide specialized services to government and INGOs to enhance the use of Calibri and to feed all of those learnings back into our open ecosystem so that we can support this do-it-yourself model at scale. I think in, think, in thinking about both this, sorry? Thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll have to move, but thank you. Yeah. I believe this is your last slide. Yeah, so just a few things. These are some ideas and I'll post them in the chat on areas for collaboration of using Calibri um, that I think might be relevant um, for the region as well as some questions to consider um, when working with different ministries. So looking at what the existing infrastructure is, what learning resources are available that could be aligned to national curriculum and what the potential is for educator support. Um, and then looking at these questions, I think that helps guide how learning equality can best support. So I'll share some links um, to get started and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is very enriching because reaching the most marginalized and uh, equity is at the heart of our work. And uh, what is also promising is that Colibri is al already in the Caribbean. Uh, you mentioned in, it's already installed in more than 22 countries and working on, uh, I also like very much the example from the Dominican Republic and also how you work and collaborate with governments. So this has been very helpful. Uh, I think the, uh, I, I rushed you on the most important slide, which was uh, potential ways of collaboration. So uh, if you can share that on chat, that would be really great. And uh, to our last speaker, thank you so much. Uh, we are so happy to uh, welcome um, uh, Video Games Without uh, a Board. Francesco Cavallari, founder and president uh, of Video Games Without Borders. The floor is yours. Hello, Francesco. Uh, hello, do you hear me? I'm hearing you, Fariel. You're fine. Um, I, Francesca, we're Francesco. Francesco, sorry. <laughs> the co host now. So he'll be with us in a minute. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And following that, Fariel, um, we will be hearing also from um, a, just a brief. Uh, presentation or share from Yui. Um, and so we're looking forward to hearing from Mr. Ramsabak. Hello, I think it's my turn, right? Because I got kicked out of the room. It and is I'm your turn, now. yes. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Yes. So let's see, here we are. So quickly, um, so we are Video Game Without Borders and uh, we are a non-profit organization and the global community. We are more than 300 people in 30 countries and uh, we, we believe in video games as a tool to change the world and especially using the sustainable development goals starting from SDG for the education as our frame of action. So that's who we are and what we have done. So we, we, our main focus has been on education as I said and uh, in, in this sense, the, the main project is called Antur and the Letters. It, it was developed in the last four years, uh, starting from the refugee crisis in Syria with more than two million children out of school. So what we did was uh, trying to offer them a, a solution that could be useful for learning to read, meaning about literacy, early child reading, and at the same time improve their psychosocial well-being. So this is uh, this were the main focus of the project. And at the same time, we have to be careful about the context in which the refugee were learning. Uh, we're supposed to use this app because it's a mobile game and how they could learn. So the game is completely free. It can work completely offline. It's completely open source and it uh, allows kids to learn by themselves. No need for any kind of supervision. And this is how the game looks. It's an adventure you go, uh, you, you travel together with your, uh, uh, puppet dog that you can customize as much as you want and through the learning you learn all the Arabic alphabet because it's about literacy in Arabic. We're talking about the Syrian in this case. And so you learn all the letters and then uh, more than 400 words 
and fewer sentences. So it's a full journey, it's a full experience integrated with an engaging system of rewards uh, that keeps the kids uh, engaged and motivated to, to go on and learn. So the game was developed in 2017, uh, in 2016, 2017, and then was tested in a refugee camp by an independent test in Azraq in Jordan, proving its efficacy both on, both on the literacy side and the psychosocial well-being. What's, inter what's interesting about the psychosocial well-being is that uh, kids were uh, not in the, let's say, in the control group, and their psychosocial well-being affected negatively by not having any intervention. By the, on the other hand, I, on the other side, kids playing the game had, had a big improvement that we can see here. So the game received several international awards and recognition, especially the, the IDWA for Syria winner that covered all the development costs. That's the, the call for innovation organized by NORAD. And it had a very positive feedback from players and families. Uh, we have almost 300,000 downloads with uh, 4.6 stars on Google Play. Uh, so that's the, uh, for us, it's just the first step because uh, for us, it's just like a pilot project. Our goal is to have offer free and open source education for all uh, through games. And so we made a version last year for uh, Morocco, specifically for Morocco with a local uh, Arabic uh, language spoken there. Uh, we are working on adapting the game for Afghanistan. So we're talking, I think, about Persian and Pashto, the two main languages. And we already received an award from the UNCR about that. And uh, uh, last year, we also released a new game, it's called uh, uh, Learn English with Antura, that is about different subjects. It's not about literacy, in this case, about learning a foreign language. Uh, we did it together with the Ministry of, Uruguay, Ministry of Education in Uruguay, and it's now used in all primary school in, in the country. The game is available for free uh, in the rest of the world, so you can download it anywhere. Right now, it's, the instructions are only available in Spanish and Italian, but we are working to make it available in many more languages. And uh, by next week, we hope to release a new game that is about learning French. So also French uh, it could be learned with the same system that is a different pedagogical approach, but with exactly the same universe, the same characters. And uh, more recently, because of the coronavirus crisis, we just decided to take a challenge of making game to help on, uh, on this uh, emergency. And that's what we did. We, it's a game we developed in a very short time, in one month and a half. Uh, and we released a few weeks ago, few weeks ago. it's called Flatten Island, and it's all about learning how to flatten the curve. So there is an educational part in it, but at the same time, in fact, what you do is that you have to take decision every day, listening to different advisors, and then this way you manage your curve, and that you have to manage your resources as well, your hospitals and stuff, and also the public opinion, until you can discover the vaccine that is really the way you win. So in some way, it seems a very simple game, but it's pretty deep in terms of how it can evolve. And it's really hard to win, as I can, I can tell you. But the, the, the other part for me that is really key is that the, the main goal for it is not only the education part, but it's also to raise funds. We are experimenting using video games as a tool to raise funds for the fight against the COVID-19. So we are now supporting several campaigns, including the one for the, from the United Nations Foundation for the World Health Organization. And uh, you can get more on the website, flattenisland.org. The game, again, is completely free, but players are invited to donate. So that's what we do. We, we believe in games to make a better world. That's it. Thank you so much. This is, this is very important because social and emotional well-being of learners is, is, go, is a major concern for us in the Caribbean. and. Uh, uh, school leaders and teachers are concerned about this and they're also uh, I had some dialogue with the, some of our member states and they they are keen to learn uh, what are some lessons we can learn from video games to to see how students interact with each other and how uh, because kids are feeling isolated at times of you know so I think it would be interesting to explore further and I would like to thank all the presenters for your extremely valuable presentations and for sharing with us what you are doing and what could be relevant within the current context today in the Caribbean. And with this, I thank you all. And I would like to invite my colleague, Lat
Victoria Swaby Anderson to moderate the next session uh, so that we can really listen to our member states. And also we have a youth representative with us. And uh, so over to you, uh, Latoya. And UV is also with us. So we want to really see how we can now open up the dialogue and see how we can work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Fariel. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our presenters as well. Um, this has surely been uh, instructive. We have so much to glean from and um, even to make some decisions. But I'm sure that before we reach the point of decisions, this is an opportunity to hear from our participants, from our member states, um, from our partners, um, to hear from them what their views are, what their concerns are, and also um, for the recommendations as well as how we can move forward as a region and even at the regional and national levels. Um, to start our conversation though, we really want to hear from um, our representative from the University of the West Indies. We want to open the dialogue with Mr. Ram Subhag, who is a learning support supervisor and chair at the UAE Learning Committee. And so, Mr. Ramsabag, um, we really want to thank you for um, coming in and joining with us. And we want to hear your perspective, your views on what you have heard, and also just what has been occurring in the region and your thoughts around that, how we can strengthen our response overall. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. Good morning. Um, yes, the Open Campus and the university, we had to actually hit the ground running um, with this um, COVID-19 pandemic. We had to um, transition our entire region because the Open Campus spans the entire region, right? We have um, presence in all the English-speaking Caribbean countries. And um, we had to transition our region from face-to-face -face type delivery to online delivery um, in an emergency mode, right? So uh, essentially, we, we learned some things on the ground while beyond being on the ground. Uh, we recognize that we have um, connectivity issues across the Caribbean. We recognize that we have um, you know, access to devices. We recognize that um, you know, teachers were not comfortable moving, uh, making that shift. We recognize that students, um, although they, they were a little more comfortable, they didn't have the, the necessary tools to be able to make that shift. So uh, we had some, a lot of lessons that we learned um, within this time. Um, one thing, a couple of things I'd, I'd like to highlight that we, we should take note of is um, accessibility, making sure that we, we don't forget our differently abled students as we make the shift. Um, it, it is critical that we take everyone uh, along with us, right? And that's one thing that we recognize that really was a challenge within um, this region. Uh, another thing is um, keeping that data and being, uh, getting close and intimate with the data using that um, learning analytics data that we get from our different systems across the region. Um, it's quite critical that we understand how to read that data, how to understand that data, and how to use that data tra to transition and um, transform the way we do things um, as we go forward, right? And um, we also recognize, uh, because we're now making that shift again back to um, open up, opening up borders, um, going back to face-to-face -to -face type operation, um, we recognize that there's still a need to maintain our um, online presence. So uh, a blended mode of delivery should be um, what we should be looking at as we move forward. So th those are just some of the things off the top of my head, um, you know, as we, we learn some lessons on the ground. I think we really need to concentrate on that blended um, mode delivery, focus on it, um, train people how to use it, make sure that we build that infrastructure as we move forward. So anything like this happen again, as well as we, we, we do open access to, to, to many um, students, teachers, when we um, allow for this um, mode of interaction um, within the region. So uh, that's it. It's a mouthful, but thank you. <laughs> no, but, but thank you so much, sir. Very important. And, and what we're hearing from you is the need to overall to strengthen, to build resilience in our, in, within our systems um, for any shock or shocks that will come to education. And uh, we definitely live in a region that there, it's not just about um, the virus in this, in this particular scenario, but um, climate issues, um, you know, natural disasters, things like that. So um, as small island development states, so most, for the most part, we have to think about how we can build resilience in our system. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. We want to hear now from our youth. We have, uh, we want to hear our youth perspective. And of course, we're hearing from our member states. So we thank the Global Coalition for having shared their presentations. But we want to start the response and the reaction from our member states. And so we're, we're hearing from, from academia, um, Kevin, and we're going to hear from Kivi, who is a young person, academic himself, a youth leader. Um, and so we're happy to have him on board, as well as we'll be hearing from a parent. Um, just what are some of their needs and we'll open the floor afterwards to hear from other participants, their questions, comments, recommendations. Over to you, Kivi. All right, so good morning to everyone. Once Tell again. us where you're representing as, as well, please. Tell us the country that you're representing. Well, I'm representing <laughs> St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes. Thank you. So I'm asked to speak about some of the concerns that we as youth face from distance learning. Now, earlier up in the presentation, Mr. Val Mendes stated that 670 million children, students, are not getting the minimum requirements of maths, English, etc. Now, not only is this one of the many concerns that we face having um, distance learning, but also the one-on-one -on -one interactions that some of us as students strive for to see. This one-on-one -on -one interaction has been reduced not only with the one-on-one -on -one interaction, but there are several distractions that we face on the regular. Now, distance learning can be defined as students learning or having education without students being physically present in a classroom with a teacher. Now, at home, at a library or wherever, there are several distractions that we might face. You know, <laughs> you might be outside and somebody might be making a delivery. So the person will be knocking on the door you can't focus on what is being said and you have to leave, get that delivery, come back and you might miss an important topic. Now, these distractions are, yes, they're a key concern, but also another key concern is our social lives have been reduced. Meeting new students, interacting with them, they may not necessarily be in our class, but meeting them on the school compound and interacting with them. For example, in the case of UWE, or even in the case of Harvard, which is a university, you will meet persons of different cultures, learn different things, even different learning styles. And by having this reduced, us as students, we can, we generally would be introverts <laughs> instead of being um, persons outgoing and stuff like that. And finally, another concern that I wrote down is that Physical learners, persons to learn by test, persons to learn by um, doing mm -hmm. exercises, this mm -hmm. has been reduced. So now yes. students have to find different means and ways of training themselves, exercise, doing exercises in order to learn. And Mr. Sorry. Mr. Robert Lou mentioned earlier about textbooks and ebooks that they have available at the mm -hmm. Lab Exchange program. Now, this would help students who are physical learners to go and read some ebooks because the material may not be available to us. So we can go use these ebooks, read, learn, and even quiz ourselves. And finally, because my time is running now, <laughs> this Lauren Lichman with yes. the Colibri program, she stated that it helps to group students. So in the case of one-on-one -on -one interactions, mm -hmm. By promoting this program in different countries, because in my country is not promoted, by promoting this program in different countries, we can reduce having one to 90 something students on a platform because some of these students might be distracted. So by having a smaller group of students, mm. for example, this participation group of 43 participants, sorry, having a small group of students would help better the interactions put for say thank you so much no problem thank you no thank you and I, what i love about you is that um you you fully integrate with what um others have been saying you know you find you find those entry points as well as you give your recommendations all in one so thank you so much kiwi so so keep keep online you know and and we'll hear from you thank you we want to hear go right to um lucette montgomery and um, please tell us where you're from where what, what country you're representing 
and, and just really seriously in the set, we want to hear from you from a parent perspective. We heard um, in several of the presentations, the considerations around caregivers and parents as well. And this is because parents are really expected to, on, on the home front and the caregivers to carry the baton as it relates to the continuity of learning. So share with us um, your, your concerns, your recommendations around that. You are muted, so I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic, please. See, technology. <laughs> Good morning <laughs> again, everyone. I am a part of the UNESCO team, and I've been just asked um, to share the perspective from a parent. Um, I'm a I have a daughter who is an eight-year-old or just turning eight, and uh, there's so much going on with this era of COVID, and there is a perceptive ideology that all children are excited about online learning and because they use their tablets so often and they're so au fait with technology, even more so than older persons, that all children are happy with all of the, the um, products that are being put out in the online sphere. But I, I just want to ask us to look at a few questions that other parents might have with connectivity. It was very good this morning to hear from Microsoft that they're opening up their platforms that are eternally free in some regards to help us as parents and children. However, for example, my daughter does not like Zoom, does not like Skype, does not like any of that. She wants to be able to go back out and interact with her friends and she wants to be able to see her teacher. And so I was very happy to see Video Games Without Borders showing us additional ways that we may get children to interact as well so that they don't feel that they're far removed from the classroom space also and that there are other areas that they can learn because video games are a strong way of showing children how to learn and become a part of a developed society. So the questions for parents are psychosocial support. How do we show children care during this time during COVID? How do we even reduce the amount of time that they spend on their screens? And how do we try to get students to be totally involved? So I think this was a very, very, very good forum. I was particularly pleased to hear from TV and, and what their thoughts are on the ground at the University of the West Indies and how we're trying to assist students during this time and there's a lot going on for parents and is a trying time so i was Thank glad you. to hear that there's data encryption and that yes. it should be more so now thank you so much mr robert Lee, for talking about the technological perspective that will be put in for events and practical areas thank of biotechnology so thank you guys so so much and from my perspective just to close that so yeah, i'll say let us all think about practical ways in which we can assist students, assist parents. Yes. It's a bit chaotic. There's a lot happening. You know, there are things that we think right. versus yes. what is the reality that's happening on the ground. So I just want to share a slide that I generated really quickly in terms of the perspective of parents, chaos or connectivity what the reality is at home, as TV said, you know, you're doing multiple tasks, there's so much going on, and you also have to teach your students. So having Thank technology you. that works is really important for working mothers. So Thank whether it's, so we, it's either we're going to go with chaos or connectivity, and this workshop or this webinar really showcase or consultation showcase the way forward. So we're grateful for that. Thank you so much, Lucette. Thank you so much. And so we really want to um, thank you for sharing that. Um, we want to also thank you for um, just really just bringing us back and giving us some laughter around that as well. Um, you know, just based on what is happening. We want to hear also from other members, other participants. We want to hear from you. Any questions that you have, any uh, for clarification, this is the time. This is the time. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, you know, you feel as though you're 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 shopping and you're trying to find out, but you know what what works best for you um, as ministries of education and partners and planners and colleagues. All we want to hear from you. So we're we're thanking you for coming on board and and sharing your 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 questions um, and your concerns with us. Feel free um, to, it's an open mic. <laughs> okay.
Hello? Yes, I like yes. to make a comment. Yes, 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 SG. Hanam. Yes, uh, okay. Um, morning, colleagues. This time I'm not calling in capacity as SG. I'm going, to, I'm going to build on the point raised by my colleague, Karen Lucet. I'm not an, I'm appearing, but not in the immediate vicinity. But I'm calling as the representative of the National Parent Association and also of the Caribbean Parent Teachers Association. When I listen to the presentations that are being made, I will not, I'm not questioning the content or the format of the presentation. But there's an important element that is in my mind that is being as we proceed. In my mind, as part of the education system, there are different components, different important stakeholders. And I will not renege on the fact that parents are an important stakeholder in the education system. That is reflected in the Constitution, the Education Act of many countries by what is called PTR, HSA. Home I'm sorry, SG, just, just, a, just a second. I'm hearing a feedback. Oh, it's gone now. Thank you. So I'm going to ask everyone just to close your mic. Thank you. Go ahead, SG. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying an important element of that as is included in the Education Act of many countries, what is called PTA, where they are represented and they sit on school boards and they're an integral part of the education system in many countries worldwide. So if we are going to proceed, we must, and I mean must, not casually, not on the fringes, but include parents as an integral part of the education system going. When COVID exploded, it also exploded and impacted on parents. Their lives, our lives was also discombobulated in terms of how to adapt with having our children. Not at home three, day, three hours per day, but an entire day. Not mindful of the fact that also the yes. challenges of the technology also impacted on many of them. So therefore, any discussion going forward, yes. whatever coalition must include those aspects that will speak to the that will speak to the, the, the role of the parents. parents. Teachers, important element equally. Parents, because I always say, if parents refuse to send their children to school, nobody will get paid and school <laughs> will be closed. So consider parents as an important element in the in process. Now I look forward to their active engagement. Yes. Not just as fundraisers, but as important stakeholder contributing to the discussions contributing to the various points that will be put forward as we move forward in discussion of things. So those are my initial comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. S Thank you so much, Everton. I'll say Everton, right on point. Thank you so much. Um, we're opening the floor. Um, is there anyone else, some of our participants, uh, colleagues who would want to share, who would want to also, remember we also have lab exchange, we have learning equality, we have videos without borders, we have Blackboard, we have Microsoft. Um, if there's anything that you want to react to um, or ask a particular question or comment to any of our presenters, please feel free to do so at this time. Hello. Uh, hello, hello. Hello, good, good day. Let me say good day, depending on where you are. <laughs> can you just introduce yourself and you can go ahead with your question or comment? Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Ismail Noble and I am in the Lees at the moment and I am the ICT manager for the Ministry of Education. So as I indicated in the chat earlier, I have three questions. Um, the first one would be directed to Blackboard. Um, they, in their presentation, their primary focus was regarding training um, for pro professional development for teachers and the like. Um, the question I have for them is primarily which type of platform are they, are they training or providing training in? Is it focused solely on teams or is it something that is vendor agnostic or something Thing else altogether. Um, that would be very so, so, important. Thank, thank you, Mr. Noble. I'm hearing parts of what you're saying, but I heard a question to Blackboard no, about yeah, what the platform, what platform. Particular mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, what kind of platform they're using to train us? Yes. Is it vendor okay. agnostic? Is it something else? Um, yes. So that we know what we would be um, locking ourselves into if we do choose them. Okay, so that's question one. Yes, and do you want to 
to ask the other question. I'll just so that's for Blackboard. Yeah. Yes. Question two is for Microsoft, and it also touches on Lab Exchange and the Collabri folks. Um, so, what type of integration do these guys offer as it pertains to their platform? Um, do they have any kind of integration to third party applications? So, for example, in the event that we choose to focus our um, online learning and distance learning using Microsoft Teams. Um, is there a way to hook back into any other platform that is currently existing? So can we connect uh, Teams directly to Open edX, to Moodle, or something else? Are those hooks available for um, different parties who would like to um, tie these systems together? Because if it is that we start implementing systems um, what we are, in a sense, doing sometimes is creating additional busy work for ourselves because it does very little use if we do all of our work on Teams, yes. but then we have to yes. take everything from Teams, record right. it onto another platform, whereas the, it, it's easier for just the computer to deal with that automatically. Um, mm -hmm. so of course, some human input would be required for that, not but again, not Yes. If that doesn't exist, then it doesn't help us at all, and we're just adding more load more. to okay. the future. No, I, I thank you so much. Like thank you. Work. No, <laughs> thank you so much. No, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold, ask you to hold the other part of your question to allow us um to throw this out to our to our presenters, Blackboard, Microsoft Exchange. It's really a question around the platform. I see Rob is ready. Rob is ready to go. Um, and the inter. Uh, <clears throat> that was my mistake. To turn my camera. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so, so, I mean, those are really excellent questions. And in fact, this issue about a lack of internet co connectivity, which clearly both Learning Equality and Calibri and Video Games Without Borders have really thought about. I have to say, one thing to keep in mind, um, Lab Exchange is six months old. So we're just starting to think about how to handle this. And what we're actually interested in, and I can say this publicly right now, mm -hmm. is that we're very interested in partnering with those organizations that have solved the device issue, right? And start thinking about how downloadable versions, particularly of, of the virtual labs and the curricula that we're building, um, we could actually partner, for example, with Amcalibri and think about how to make um, the materials that we're building available. So we think that that's, truly incredibly important. Um, in terms of one of your other questions about um, integration with other systems, the way Lab Exchange was designed, we're designed to be like almost a lightweight version of a learning management system, like Canvas, for example, Moodle, etc. And you can download all the performance data of your students and re-upload that with one click into any of the learning management systems that you want. That be, because we were originally focused on helping folks that don't have a learning management system. Okay. They're not lucky enough to be at a school with Canvas, mm -hmm. for example. But that being said, we are in the middle of conversations with Instructure on full integration with Canvas. And I have to admit, there's, there's been the beginning of, in, of conversations with Microsoft about the possibility of Teams integration. I probably shouldn't have said that, but that is something that we're, that we're talking about now. So we're starting to get a lot of requests yes. for how we can fully integrate. So thank we're, we're looking into it. No, thank you, Robert. And I see Guillermo, he is ready now. <laughs> I hope I got that right. Yes, yes. Yeah. First, Go of all, first of all, I wanna say that I'm really excited to be here, be part, being part of this great meeting with great professionals. Uh, and if Microsoft Teams is uh, in a continuing evolution, so what what I can say is that that can be possible. We can we can make that merge of, of different uh, learning systems with Teams, and and we are encouraging a lot of institutions, educational institutions, to to work in this process. And in Puerto Rico, for example, they have been creating courses in in Moodle, and we are merging information of these platforms with Microsoft Teams. And another thing that I would like to say that uh, uh, one of the colleagues uh, said earlier that 
parents are a really important uh, part of the community. And yeah. we, in Puerto Rico, we are offering uh, workshops for parents so they can be uh, prepared for, for next events of, of remote learning. And we are giving also workshops to students so they can also learn about the a lot of tools that we have in Microsoft Teams and Office three seats five uh, and and we are really committed with the education system of, of Caribbean and Latin America and, and and we will are open to further discussions about new ways that we can help education to go on even if it's um, uh, in remote learning no thank you so much thank you so much and I see where French Ah, here we have. So Lauren is on. I was going to share, but it's better to hear it from you, Lauren. I just want to say at this point, we're at the 1025 mark. Um, we really had originally thought of this meeting as being a two hour meeting, but we are, we're, we tried for, we're trying, we, we tried for 90 minutes, but please allow us um, if we go a little over because we want to, to hear from you and then we'll go into a wrap up. So we want to hear your questions. We want to be able to respond as well to your questions and recommendations. So please allow us to go a little over the 90 minutes. Thank you, Lauren, over to you. Yeah, very quickly to respond to what some of the, what some, some of what has been shared. Um, I think in response mm -hmm. to Lucette's comment about just kind of screen fatigue, we totally understand. And I think that's one of the really important things when thinking about blended learning, which I think actually all of the presentations today have focused on, is that blended learning isn't just working within the technology, but really thinking about how the technology can be a driver for what's happening outside of the computer. So what is the kind of content that encourages project-based learning or um, encourages activities to do with caregivers or other students if you're in a class setting? And so for us, in most of the context where we're working, it's actually not a one-to-one -one student um, to device ratio. And so we've designed a platform that really helps to encourage blended learning because we similarly don't want that type of screen fatigue. We also don't think it's the best for learning. Um, and so it, it's something to really think about. In terms of third party applications, I should mention that Calibri was di designed with a plugin architecture in mind. So we really focus on the Calibri platform, um, but it can be integrated with other tools. And um, because it's open source, it allows you to more easily do that. Um, one of the challenges is that because we've designed for offline first, um, we haven't fully tested all of the great resources that are available online for integration, but um, we are currently exploring a few different partnerships and would be open to others to be able to integrate Calibri with other video conferencing tools, for example. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, COVID obviously presents a, a very different use case for us. And a lot of the work that we've done over the last couple of months was focused on working with telcos, for example, or ministries of education to have online instances of Calibri, um, where then you would expect some of this type of more interactive, real-time uh, conferencing, which doesn't always take place in a totally offline environment. Um, in terms of what Robert has shared, I do want to also reemphasize that um, for us, we are similarly taking content that's available on the internet. And so we work with a lot of different content providers. OpenStax was mentioned. We have OpenStax textbooks um, within the Calibri content library as well. And so that's one area that's obvious for us in terms of collaboration with organizations um, like the ones on this call to be able to take that con take diff to content that has been um, that is quality content has been valuable in other contexts and be able to leverage it all in an offline platform. Um, and the last thing to say is that we are also heavily focused on accessibility um, and have designed Calibri um, not just to be able to potentially be used alongside um, other assistive devices, but that the platform itself is designed with web accessibility standards in mind. And um, I think, of course, the the challenges of um, using um, these types of platforms at home for learners with special needs um, are significant, but I think important that we, we mention this commitment to accessibility and inclusivity across our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. And I think where you just went is where we want to go to because we're thinking about varied persons with varied learning styles, varied learning needs as well. And Kibi had actually alluded to that. I see Lucette and I also see that um, Francesco um, wanted to, to respond. So we want to hear from you, we want to hear from Blackboard. I think Karine is on. Um, 
we, but, but definitely um, this has been a major concern with the, within the ministries of education, um, as uh, Dr. Khan mentioned earlier as well, for persons who, based on the nature of the, uh, the area of specialization, for example, those with, within the TBET arena, um, and, and uh, what does that mean, you know, and how can these platforms support? I saw where Robert spoke about that. I think he came very near to that um, in how um, Lab Exchange is really, really facilitates that type of interaction for those, for those um, skill sets or those types of competences that would normally be learned in a lab <laughs> or in a very physical environment. Um, so special persons with special needs, that's a major challenge um, and a major concern for us. Also different types of learners. Um, we want to make sure that, um, Kippy mentioned those persons who are tactile kinesthetic, those who are visual. And, and so they really want to be engaged um, and, and to be seen as well and doing as well. So we thank you for that. The set we're going to hear from you one minute. And we also want to, we want to just first hear from Francesco. Francesco's response and then Lucette. Thank you. Hello. So. So we're seeing you, Francesco. Um, um, I was answering uh, on, uh, can you see me? Can you hear wow. me? <laughs> yes, yeah. okay. we're seeing you here. I'm yes. having connection problems, so I don't know. Can you hear me? We're hearing you, and okay. we're here talking about we're talking about connectivity. <laughs> yes. yes, that's what. Why I'm, I'm proving that this is. Solid. So even even uh, here in Europe, then. So then uh, is usually I uh, consider that among the most vulnerable families and communities around the world. Uh, it's true that uh, we were surprised about the level of connectivity they can have. I mean, it's really unreliable, but they had some level of connectivity and especially for refugees, having a mobile phone is key. It's one of the first thing they, they, they bring with them or they buy if they can. So we, we were so surprised that in fact, we were able to run a campaign online, like a digital ads campaign in order to reach them. So it's really, it's true that the big challenge is to get on the device. So it's true, that's the biggest challenge. There is even a, a an earlier challenge. One step before is that letting the people know that the, your solution exists, because I don't know, if they don't know it exists, they will not even try to get it on the device. Yes. Uh, so that's what we tried with um, with digital ads and in the context of refugees, so in a different context. I'm not, I don't have ex direct experience in the Caribbean, but uh, we were surprised how eff it effectively can be. Uh, with digital ads, we were able through Google and Facebook, we were able to get uh, one download uh, for uh, less than 20 cents of a euro. So in, in advertising. So in, in the end, it, it, it was really effective, even cheaper than running a campaign in, for you know normal families in here in, in, in Europe. So that, that's something. I, I don't know some of the situation over there, but I think there's a there's an opportunity for offline solution that you know offline online solution where you just connect only once to install it, or maybe from time to time to share the information. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Francesco. And we do see the need for that because um, even within our region, we have places um, within our small islands, as well as in, the, um, in some of our member states and territories where they have interlands. Um, interlands and, and, and in those areas, that's, un that's a challenge as well as it comes out to connectivity. Thank you so much. Lucette, over to you. I'm perfectly said, Latoya. That's exactly the point I was going to make to um, some of our listeners in, in the chat. I wanted to say um, this is a perfect opportunity for ministries to collaborate with Lauren in terms of we did a situational analysis in the Kingston office, Latoya and I and, and Farrell, in terms of realizing how many countries had severe difficulties with connectivity for those rural areas and for those hinterland areas and for children with disabilities. And that's something that we really, really want to underscore. So to hear Lauren speak about Calibri and the fact that it does not always need um, to have internet to be able to be connected is very important. So I think Lauren has included her information in the chat and I think this is a good opportunity for ministries listening in to connect with Lauren in terms of really working on those communities that are rural and that are distant and in terms of being able to make that connection with students. Very, very critical. Thank you. Nice. 
you know, agreed, Lucette, and thank you. And, I, and we are seeing what's happening in the chat because we do know because of time, um, everyone won't have an opportunity to speak, but the chat has been very lively. And so we will be making note of what's happening there and we see our presenters responding directly to questions in the chat. Questions that they are best suited to respond to <laughs> um, as related to being the, the, the subject matter expert. So we thank you for that. Um, if there are no other questions uh, um, that are, are comments um, within this space, we would like to move into our key priorities and next steps. I think um, persons are still digesting all that has been shared. I see that the chat is still continuing and I'm sure that, so this is not the end, this is just uh, uh, another step in, 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 in the journey. So we really want to continue the discussion and I'm sure that discussions will be happening bilaterally as well um, as we are looking at what best suits and what best, um, what best so sweeter solutions we can pull together to, so to continue to support each other and to share that. So are there any more questions, anything that is really um, uh, pressing that uh, you would want to ask? If not, <laughs> going once, going twice. Um, I will turn over to Fariel, who will take us now into our key priorities. And not Fariel, I'm sorry, Val Tensir. <laughs> My apologies. Val, you're ready. You're on cue. Um, yes. Who will take us into our key priorities and the next steps. Thank you so much. And then Thank we'll you. close off with our chair, Fariel. Thank you, Val. Thank you very much, Latoya. That was great, a great discussion. Um, I, before starting the QE priorities and next step, if you allow me, I'd like just to try to answer the question that was addressed to Blackboard regarding the training that we will start uh, the pilot uh, for the Caribbean region. In terms of uh, if the training requires the Blackboard platform or not, if it can be a platform agnostic, so the answer is yes. So what we want to do is the first part of the training is totally uh, independent of the platform. And uh, the content is actually about education transformation is not so linked to a specific uh, technological platform. So that is, I think is very important to, to highlight. And also when a platform is necessary, Blackboard obviously will make their and there are different tools available for free. And I want to reinforce this, that all the partners that we are bringing to the coalition, they are required to offer the, the resource for free if they come from the private sector, for example. And obviously we have, as we saw here today, different nonprofits that are already part of the coalition. So I think it's, it's very interesting, this mix of uh, different expertise that come together. And I want to reinforce again that we are in a challenging time. And uh, just today, our director uh, for uh, education, our ADG, has just mentioned in another UN event that 20 million uh, of students are at the risk of not returning to school after this crisis. So we have a big challenge here. So we have as well a huge opportunity. And I think this discussion has been very rich. So when we try to see uh, the, the key priorities, uh, I'd like to try to connect to the a previous exercise that UNESCO Caribbean have made, a previous consultation, that identifies some key initial priorities. Uh, and uh, one of the, the first one, and I think one of the, the, the priorities that actually come, uh, came as well in this discussion is teacher preparedness and capacity for online, online delivery, you not know, to create these blended uh, learning environments. So there are really real needs for reinforce this capacity building, this, um, yeah, this training in everything that has to do to use these platforms and also on how to design this pedagogic you know, learning environment. So this is one of the, the key priorities. So if we look to the partners that came together today to the Global Coalition, we know already that Blackboard is, is available to offer the first pilot. We also saw that Microsoft is working with their school leaders, a skills development, that we also can ask them to engage with the, the countries. And learning equality, maybe we can ask them if they are available for that. Lab exchange as well, video games without borders. And we have other partners that will be available. So 
the question here and uh, in terms of next step and uh, through the coordination with uh, our colleagues in the Caribbean is identify which ministries of education would be interested to start this discussion. Because as we mentioned before, it's very important to identify the real needs, the local needs in, in the different countries. So, but we see that this is an initial uh, priority in terms of teachers' uh, capacity building. We see that we already have partners that are available to, to come and build together uh, an approach. So this is the first one. The second one I would highlight in terms of a blended learning uh, planning. What we saw a little bit with Alexa's presentation and in, in with Microsoft. You know, you saw that together, Microsoft and UNESCO, we are working together to create this blueprint that is, uh, it links a little bit with uh, UNESCO policy planning in a regular context when we go to the countries and we support this uh, planning. So we, we try to do this for this emergency context and link it to a distance learning planning. So who could be uh, interested? We, we need to see which countries would be interested in this more holistic uh, support. And for that, we can bring not just Microsoft, but all the par partners that presented here today, because we saw, for example, from the equity and inclusivity uh, dimension, no? uh, we have a, a very interesting experience from Colibri, from um, Microsoft as well, and the other partners. So we can bring, we can put all them together. Also in terms of lab exchange, the, their uh, innovation in, in terms of a lab, no? Because this is, is a need when we talk to, to colleagues that are working in TVET, for example. One of the main challenges was that all the schools for TVET, they closed and uh, kids and the young people and young adults, they were not able to try, you know, to have real labs. So for example, this, we believe that uh, lab exchange can help us. Uh, so, uh, and then a last point uh, is regarding data management. You know that uh, we should have a focused uh, response and informed decision-making in all ministries of education. So for, to do that, data is key. So we are very pleased to announce that with Microsoft as well, we are launching a, a global initiative that is based in, in, on data. And finally, linked to that, uh, UNESCO partnered with uh, the World Bank and UNICEF and with the Global Education Partnership. Uh, and they, we together created a consortium with uh, uh, some resource available for some countries that are linked to the Global Education Partnership. So it's not all countries that can apply. And uh, through that, we are also developing some uh, support in terms of data. And what we are trying to do is something that can work for different countries. So it has this uh, global approach. So uh, just going back to the beginning, I reinforce and link into the next steps. So this was just a showcase with uh, uh, some important partners that we have in the coalition. Most of them, they are ready, uh, ready to join and to start an engagement with you. I, we have many uh, requests. They are uh, really uh, available to work with the ministries of education in collaboration with our Caribbean UNESCO office. So is, the invitation is here, is open, uh, and we are looking forward in terms of how to, to build this, uh, this holistic approach, but also very need, country needs oriented. So that is all from my side, and I'm looking forward to continue the discussion. Fadial, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Val, for opening up this dialogue with our member states and uh, for the very, very rich presentations that we've had today uh, from our partners. Um, I think it's the, the countries, uh, the partners have shared a lot of very exciting information uh, which is relevant and timely. And I think the next step is going to be for our uh, participants from our member states to go back to discuss internally within the ministries on how they are going to then absorb all this rich information that has been shared and then to identify priorities. Um, uh, I'm seeing different pathways going forward. One would be, for example, uh, with the blackboard, as you mentioned, with the, uh, with the pilot for a, a, a teacher preparedness and providing training to 
member states uh, to, to strengthen capacity of teachers. This would be a Caribbean region initiative. It would be, let's say, two master trainers from each country um, to, 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 to create a core of experts within the Caribbean region um, uh, on uh, remote and online training. So this would be a Caribbean approach. Um, and then there may be more country specific uh, requests that we may receive, um, uh, you know, for uh, a, a specific country may come forward and then say we want uh, to work with Microsoft or, uh, you know, learning equality or, you know, one video without borders or, um, you know, one of the country, uh, one of the partners, LabEx, on a country specific initiative. So. Uh, so this was really, um, so, so we'll have to, you know, we, uh, I think it's been very good that we've uh, had this idea of a preliminary dialogue today where information is shared with our member states. And we agreed, we haven't shared this yet. So I think this is a good opportunity to share that uh, we thought we should have a two-step process of consensus building and uh, exploration. So the next dialogue will be with on the 22nd of July, where we hope to bring all of you together, uh, but also bring on board our education partners in the region, because we have UNICEF, World Bank, GPE, CARICOM, um, the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And, and, and we hope that we can, at the next level, bring together uh, the larger group to have a consultative process because our, uh, our efforts are to ensure, to harmonize, our interest is to harmonize our efforts, to align with national priorities, but also to enable partners to avoid duplication and to complement each other's activities on the ground. So, so, so I think the way we are moving forward, we are putting the building blocks in place. Um, today was a very rich dialogue. Uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, valuable data has been shared. And as a next step, I, I, I would like to you know, uh, encourage our member states to go back to maybe have internal discussions within ministries of education. Um, and then to perhaps come back prepared with maybe some more, you know, specific and, 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 uh, and countries are invited to contact us directly at the Caribbean office. If you have any clarifying questions, if you want to, uh, to you know, uh, have some additional information about a specific initiative, if you want to explore your ideas with us. So from now till the 22nd, you know, we are also available to, you know, have that interaction. So we open up our doors, the Caribbean office with our member states. And then um, on the 22nd, it would be really wonderful then if we can move our dialogue a little further ahead. And, um, uh, but, but I, I really feel um, we need to absorb and digest, as my colleague Latoya said, and our member states also, because sometimes we are not in a situation to make a decision on the spot, but to take the information back, consult with our uh, colleagues uh, at country level. So I think this has been very valuable and, um, uh, and we want to thank uh, our, our uh, presenters for the, um, for the very rich dialogues uh, that we've had today. Um, I mean, blended modalities are timely solutions for us to move forward in these times of COVID-19, uh, um, moving on with the new reality. But, but, but as some of, I heard the voices that we want to build resilience for distance, uh, for disasters in the region and to build on the systems. So it's not just looking at COVID, but we want to look ahead and build long-term resi uh, resilience within education systems. And I thought having a youth representative uh, and uh, having uh, Lucette's um, uh, viewpoints as a parent were very important for us uh, because we want to have a holistic approach and see uh, how we can then um, respond to the diversity of needs in the region. So um, as a next step, uh, I invite you all to block the date for the 22nd of July for a more in-depth dialogue. 
And I think, Val, we would then also see what would be the expected outcomes of the, the dialogue on the 22nd of July, and then how we are going to, so we will continue to also liaise with you and uh, seek guidance from our team at headquarters. But, um, but, but we are also going to keep our doors open with our partners, the members of the Global Coalition who have been so generous with their time today. And if we have any clarifying questions or as we receive requests, we will uh, keeping our uh, Val in the loop, we will, uh, you know, uh, keep our communications open. So this is uh, um, uh, a step by step process where now we know more about the global coalition. Uh, some of us in the region were not fully aware of what it really was, what it means, and how men, members, uh, member states can actually receive support from partners. So I think this has been a very strong message and uh, that uh, the partners are there to provide support uh, to our members, uh, countries. And um, uh, we look forward uh, to continuing this dialogue on the 22nd of July. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us today, uh, for, for the generosity of your time, for the rich presentations, and for sharing your perspectives, challenges, and needs from the country level. Um, so uh, I want to close on this happy note that Blackboard already has agreed to have um, a teacher training um, uh, pilot for the Caribbean states having fought, uh, uh, you know, uh, all 20 countries on board. And perhaps this training will take place as soon as Jul end of July, because some, uh, this would be a four week training, uh, Val, uh, from what I understand. Uh, and, and this would, um, because like, uh, member states want to be ready as they reopen schools in September. So the timing would be really great from end of September uh, July to the end of August, which gives the time for the master trainers to have the training uh, for remote and distance learning, and then take it to the, um, uh, as a, uh, you know, because then the teachers, the next step would be the cascade model, where they will then, uh, you know, share that training with teachers. So I think this is going to be very timely, and this will uh, enable our countries to open schools uh, you know, um, uh, as part of the reopening strategy. So this is going to be already be a big support for us. And uh, we thank you for making this happen. And we thank Blackboard for making I want to, you know, uh, if anyone has a last burning question, uh, we have you know, five minutes before we just say goodbye and thank you. So the floor is yours. If anybody wants to raise your hand and uh, say something, this is a good moment to do so. Latoya, would you like to say something? Oh, no, no, Farial. Um, no, I agree with you. If there's anybody or from our presenters, if there's one last thing that I, I know that we are over time, <laughs> if there's one last thing that anybody wants to say, no, that's fine. Thank if, you if very I, much. Sorry, Thank if you. I may, sorry, just just one second, if I may, yeah? Of course. Thank you, sorry. Uh, no, just uh, thank you again and reinforce that uh, uh, we have obviously more partners in the Global Education Coalition, um, but the ones we brought today, we think that they really have a very important uh, asset, they have uh, important uh, work done already in the context of UNESCO and other UN agencies. And uh, in, if we have here colleagues uh, from different ministries of education in the region that are right now designing or thinking about you know, their uh, distance learning program, please reach out to uh, our colleagues in the Caribbean. And because we have this uh, international perspective, a lot of expertise. So all these organizations, they are put uh, their human resource with years of uh, experience and digital uh, learning in, in planning uh, remote learning. So we have, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, a great opportunity to make of this challenging moments a, a, a big uh, success in terms of delivering a better and resilient uh, education system. So just reinforce this message that we are here to support you. Thank you. Back to you, Fadiel.
Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, just to wrap up with what you said, then how do we mainstream these efforts? How do we create a coherent program uh, at, either at the level of the Caribbean region or but also for a country specific program. So I think uh, we've, we've had the, it's been like looking at the full menu of options that are available to us today. And I think now our member states are going to go back and reflect on you know what would be a priority that best fits with their needs, aligning with national priorities, harmonizing with the work that other partners are doing on the ground, and then developing you know, translating the, these into a coherent national program that works uh, at a country level. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. We appreciate your time and your generosity and your sharing of perspectives. And we will continue this dialogue on the 22nd of July. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I guess the meeting is closed. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.